What's up, everybody? It's Alex from Heavy New York. We are not at the Gramercy Theater today. We're not at St. Vitus today. We're not at the Alta Music Headquarters. Today, we are here in my own house with my good friend, Mr. Nature G of Tanger Calvary. Thank you, Alex. Oh, it's so great to have you here, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's so great that Tanger Calvary is back. You know, I know that you had to take a bit of a break from the music, but, you know, after hearing the latest single, and you definitely came back with a vengeance, it's so great to have you back, man. I like that you said the word vengeance. <laughs> well, you did. I mean, you know, you came back full force because with CMB, it meant fight your darkness. And I really feel like there was an essence of fighting darkness with CMB. And then I really feel like with the latest single heart that you put out, that you actually conquered that darkness. And now it seems like, you know, you, I think you made music that could share people's pain. And now you, I think you made music that could share people's victories as well. I think you nailed the music, man. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Yeah. Or it's maybe because I played the shit out of the last record. I mean, I would say, you know, you kind of nailed most of the meaning of the music. Yeah, I, I think that is exactly what those songs are about, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, because I feel like your songs, obviously you have a message behind your music and a concept. You, it, it doesn't exactly take much analyzing to know that you're expressing your culture, your personal experience, your, and everything else. But... At the same time, I feel like it also is open to interpretation. I feel like you're using your lessons to teach people other lessons. Kind of, you know, I don't try to teach someone something. I, I think it mostly is more like a, you know, trying to influence other people with the right way and with music, you know, trying to get some message out there, you know, and, you know, it's like a conversation, you know. It yeah. doesn't necessar necessarily mean a lesson, but I think it's more like an approach to people and see how they react, you know. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I, I mentioned this in my, um, in my podcast that we did back in the winter, but, like, what I was – what I found so fascinating is you've done what a lot of, like, folk metal bands have done. I'm just calling it folk metal for lack of better words. Whether it would be a band like Tear – who kind of brings in the acapella music from the Faroe Islands in their music, or a band yeah. like uh, like Ansafirum that kind of has that Finnish Viking style to it. You Definitely. bring in your traditional Mongolian culture in your music. What I was always curious about, and I don't even think I brought it up, it was like a question I had the minute you left my house the day when we did the podcast. What came first in your musical career? Did you want to make Mongolian music to express your culture, or did and the metal kind of came in secondary, or were you like a metalhead who just wanted to bring in your own experience into the style of metal? I think both approach kind of grow at the same time. You know, metal comes first uh, when I was in my middle school, so that was that was pretty early. But the traditional Mongolian folk music that was separate from heavy metal. So at that time, I was doing both separately. But then until a point that when I listened to like. Uh, some early uh, Viking metal, and I kind of realized, you know what, maybe I can bring them actually together, you know. So in the beginning, it was all separate, and then uh, after, you know, listening to different stuff, you know, uh, being exposed to different uh, uh, folk metal culture, I kind of get the idea, you know, you know, maybe you can, you can put them together, why not, you know. So that was the, uh, the idea. Well, I feel like both parties can really learn a thing or two from each other. People who might have grown up with the traditional Mongolian folk music may have not discovered a Slayer record. But no. I feel like you have the best of both the worlds where you could enlighten your traditional culture on metal. And vice versa, people who are into metal who may have not known the first thing about the Mongolian culture are now into it because of what you've done. Yeah, um, I think, you know... Um, it's, it's like a conversation, you know, and also it's like a conversation across different genres, but also at the end, you kind of feel like both have so much, uh, you know, in common with each other. So, you know, it, it's, it's cool to, you know, learn that, you know, this two different genres are connected um, in the spiritual way. Yeah. And also to learn uh, how different are they and, you know, how to compose and, you know, put them together and stuff like that. Yeah, and it, it was really, because I feel like going back to like the whole message behind your music, like a song like The Old War, that made me like question what war you were talking about. And uh, so like, it seems like you have a history lesson, but you also have a personal connection with the music as well, right? Yeah, you like that song. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's my favorite song on the record. Um, that song is pretty hard to explain, but uh, I think the message behind it is, is very... 
uh, pretty much like what you just said. You know, it, the old word is more like a, it's a very controversial perspective about how modern people perceive war, historical war. Like, because you know, nowadays I、um, I see like young people were talking about,、oh, yeah, the war culture. You know, people worship that. You know, we have I see pop culture worship violence and stuff. And in a sense, there's a, there's a good side of it. You know, it, it make people、uh, become better and stronger. But also, if you took it in the wrong way, you know, people see the Asian violence as you know something cool or something、uh, that you don't have to pay a price. You know, it's more like you know, oh, you just it's, it's something look cool or you know, it's something that、uh, make you feel better when you、uh, you know encounter some problem. I'm like, that's not the point of the history of the war. You know, those those war、uh, were built on people's lives. So you know, we gotta. Look at the history in a more、um, a reasonable and more like a realistic way, you know, not just not just fantasizing, you know, like oh, you know, the Asian war is really cool because I, you know, in pop culture I do see that a lot. So you're kind of going back to maybe Sun Tzu's idea of the art of war, like that sort of ideology. Kind kind of, you know, more like you know, look at the history. Uh, in a modern way, but with a careful and more, you know, try to you know learn about the history of what why there was there there was those war and、um, what triggered them and you know it's not just you know oh we worship the old ways or you know because I do see that in pop culture sometimes. Yeah, and and I find it fascinating that you're able to counteract a modern day pop culture ideology. With a traditional style of music, that yeah, that's kind of kind of the idea, you know, to counter the modern idea with a traditional way, but also with metal, which is modern, you know. Of course. So it's more like a very. That's why, like, this song doesn't take side. You know? I don't want to say, oh, anti-war or no, you know, pro-war. You know, like, this song doesn't take any side. It's more like a philosophical idea to like. There's good in it. There's there's yin in it. There's yang in it. But you know, it all depends on、uh, how we. Perceive it, you know. Yeah, and then moving on to another song that, which is another one of my favorite songs on the record, which is the title track CMD,、mm-hmm. also titled "Fight Your Darkness." That really seems to be. I don't know if you were there was sort of like a history lesson in tradi- in that, but in the end, both like I would say the lyric, both lyrically and musically, especially when it got into that slow orchestrated part, it almost does seem to. Counteract a dark element that we can feel within each other, right? Was、yeah. that more of like a personal song? Um, that song, uh, that song borrowed a title from a historical tribe from northern China. You know, they were,、uh, as I explained in、uh, the album title video,、um, that tribe was like kind of symbolized the first、uh, pre-Mongol tribe who immigrated into northern China. So it was a historical idea, but in this song, this song specifically、uh, is this song. Talk a a lot about、uh, how to you know conquer your personal struggle、um, with you know、uh, motivation and inspiration, kind of like that. You know, it's kind of like a play around with the idea. You know, it's like it kind of use the historical name, but also within the song, it convey a universal topic that everybody can relate to. That's kind of the idea. Yeah, it, it, and being that though, like. You know, you grew up in this nomadic culture and this tribe in Mongolia, and you know, I don't know really many other metalheads or just people in general who had that experience. I would almost—I don't know if this is the right way of putting it—but it almost seems like you could probably relate to the music probably more than anybody, right? Because you are utilizing s- stuff from a culture that you were actually brought up in, right? Yeah, I mean. Is really just to you know kind of like what the、uh, the the Viking metal band did for for the Viking folk you know like、uh, now the Viking folk becomes such a, like a, you know popular thing because you know, everybody just loves it and you know it's because you know they brought the traditional stuff you know the traditional fiddle from Scandinavia、uh, into the metal songs and people enjoyed it you know so and I like the idea that you know you're they're using a modern Technique, modern music language to revive a traditional mentality, you know, and it's, it's like a, it's, it, I think it's a, it's definitely a, a development for the music. Yeah, you know, one artist who I always thought was really good at telling their stories from his own culture and his own personal experience would be Body Count Ice T, because 
you know, obviously rap music has always addressed the problems with the streets, but yeah. you didn't really necessarily hear it too much in the world of metal, but it seemed like Ice-T really... He brought the hood culture into the metal culture. Yeah. The people actually... I was actually listening to uh, Body Count um, for, for, for a while, and I was like, yeah, I, I'm actually learning a lot about the hood culture uh, that he's talking about in the metal song that actually brought you into the scene and you actually oh this is what they actually live in you know it's like you, you feel that from a first person perspective you know which makes you more real for anybody to relate to you know I think that's that's just great yeah and I always feel like metal is such an honest and in your face form of music that if there's any point you want to get across whether it's a personal experience or something about culture it just seems like metal is such a straightforward point of view whether it's a band like Motley Crue telling you about how to party in life or a band like uh, Disturbed who's very serious behind their lyrics it seems like it's such an honest riff driven form of music it almost seems like any point you want to get across you can with metal right right yeah yeah now part now this might be a bit of a what if question but if somebody like I know a lot of musicians in hardcore don't like this if like a newer person who may have not have had the same experience that the hardcore crowd started in and they kind of use a similar gimmick if somebody were to kind of use a similar style of traditional Asian music and metal would, but didn't necessarily have the same experiences you had would that kind of defeat the purpose you would think it all comes down to like a, a personal experience so I don't really I, I don't really think I have the authority to say talk about that you know if yeah. somebody from uh, from you know like a western countries feel like they're close to other country, countries culture and they want to express through that tool. I think there's no problem with that. I mean, it all depends on your own personal motivation. So I think there's nobody can judge, you know, judge that. Absolutely. Yeah. And now going into your newest single, Heart, which you released, because I was not expecting that. I remember when you released it, I just finished my interview with Chris Broderick. And as I was editing my interview, I pulled up Facebook and I saw Tanger Calvary's first post since you announced uh, your dismissal back in the winter. And I was just like, I was not expecting this at all. Really? Yeah, I wasn't. I mean, you know, you and I were hanging out and you, you hinted that you were, you know, working with music again, but you didn't go into specifics about that. Right. So I was A, really happy. I didn't tell you the date of the recruitment. That's <laughs> yeah, thank you, because the surprise, that, that surprise is something I won't forget. Yeah. But being that, you know, I'm, you know, from what we talked about, it was kind of like a dark time earlier in 2018 for both of us. And definitely, and it seemed like that this is was as I mentioned your way of coming back with a vengeance. Did what you went through in the early portion of twenty eighteen influence this song? Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know the song. The song was like originally like thirteen minutes long. It's like one three minute. That's all. That's that's almost like uh, two or three songs in, in together. And so, um, you know, I, I really wanted to push myself to write a song very long, conveys a lot of idea, but just within one song. So that was like, um, it's like, you know, I set up a little push up for myself, you know, try to test, you know, where, can, how far can I go? You know, because, you know, this is a comeback song, you know, you better know that, you know, of course. So um, that was the idea about, about like the, how, how do I build the song, you know, and how, how do I, you know, structure everything. Yeah. Well, you know, when a band breaks up and they do do get back together, whether they're on hiatus or they reunite, whatever, you know, they always want to come back with something that's going to really pack a punch. At what point did you say to yourself, Tanger Calvary needs to come back? May. May 13th, I think. Really? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's that day. I can't remember what happened, but, you know, it's like a flash in your brain. It's like, no, you got to stand up again, you know. Because yeah. for some bands, they broke up because, you know, um, you know they are, the band has a relationship problem or, you know, they just don't want to write anymore. But that's none of that is my, my situation. My situation was I just didn't feel like writing music because of what happened to me. So it's more like a discouragement uh, from outside. You know? It wasn't from inside. So that's why I, I think, you know what, I, I, I think there's still a little bit like... Uh, little like flame inside of me you know it's somewhere you know i probably should make it bigger <laughs> well i mean and i'd imagine that during the time that tanger calvary was um kind of dormant that allowed you to do that if, if you kind of just pushed through tanger calvary and didn't 
take this break. I don't think I can make it. You know, we had three major European festivals that Napalm Record booked for us, and I just didn't think I could make it. You know, like no, like they they the oh, I forgot the name of the festival. They're all really good European festivals, but at that time, you know, I just need a you know really need to recover. You know. Yeah. Well, you got to put your mental health first, right? I mean. Just for the sake of my music, I gotta do that too, you know. So, you know, for the sake of the fans, you know, for the sake of everybody, I, I gotta just take a break. You know, I'm glad that Napalm Record they understood at that time. You know, I'm glad they, um, they they, they could understand it somehow. But yeah, you know, shout out to the staff at mm, Napalm. Yep, yeah, they're De- great people. Definitely. I mean, uh, they 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 gave me uh, time. You know, they didn't rush me. You know, so but I, I did tell them, you know, listen, I really need to take some time off. You know, they just you know a lot happened to me. Um, as a young new artist who just came into the industry, you know, a lot of things I, I didn't expect. So I need to, you know, take some time, really. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, being that CMB is a phenomenal record. It's in heavy New York's top fifty right now. Like, you know, that obviously to make something that good couldn't have been easy. I almost feel like that you were kind of even I was listening to it, be like, oh my god, I wonder how exhausted they must be putting out a record like this, right? Uh, you know, the, the record, the, the song writing, the record itself wasn't that hard, you know. Like, writing the music was actually pretty easy. It's, it's more like what came after that. Yeah. That was the hardest part. For me, like, music is really about expressing myself. So I, I didn't find, find that uh, really hard. I think is what what else left uh, for me to manage around the album. That's what is like, you know, like you said, like that is the hardest thing. Yeah, but it's great that you, and obviously during this time when you were regrouping yourself, now that Tanger Calvary's back and you're ready to conquer the world again, it almost seems like these lessons that you've learned during during Tanger Calvary's break, it almost seems like now it's very hard to stop you guys, right? Uh, yeah, but I think now I want to like approach the whole thing in a different different way. You know, in the past we we're a little bit too, you know, one, two, three, four, bang, bang, bang like a boxing, you know. But yeah. now I, I kind of just want to you know chill a little bit and you know go slow, uh, do one more show and see where it takes. You know, don't be too ambitious. You know, just you know see where it takes you. you yeah, know? you know you want to dip your foot back in the water. You don't want to dive right into it again. Exactly. Exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Now, if you don't mind me asking, during the course of Tanger Calvary's uh, hiatus, what were you doing, like, exploration-wise? I mean, I, I do know, but if you want to, like, uh, you mean, to, like you, you traveled a little bit, and that definitely the, the helped. inspiration for music? Yeah. Uh, I think mostly, I would say, it's really, uh, I personally feel like it's like uh, having some time with myself and kind of makes, making sense uh, for everything that happened to me, that was like a like a like almost like a repair to the music music part of me, um, you know, because you know when you fight for too long, you kind of you know, you kind you kind of shattered inside. So you know you got to put yourself back, glue it together somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that process of gluing yourself back uh, is pretty important. Not to say you know oh, I need to feel good. Not not about that. I mean even just you know for uh, writing music for write, writing better music for fans. You know I think even for that, uh, it's just important. You know it's yeah. not even just for myself. You know it's just like for people around me for for everything. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And I, one I, unfortunately one disadvantage that I think you've had and I've had it too. You know, we both came from re- relatively rural areas of the world, and then we moved to the city of chaos, like New York City. I mean, it, <laughs> let, let's just get one thing straight here. New York City is the most metal city because of how much darkness that is around here. And I'd imagine that that also played a role into having to regroup, right? Yeah. I mean, New York has the best thing offered to the world, but it also had the most... Um, coldest thing that you can experience and we're not talking about the winter no no not the winter we're (laughs) we're talking about you know um just everything you know everything else yeah it's it's not like you know um because alex you're born in new york right but uh, upstate like but you're oh you're 30 30 30 miles north like i was able to see the city from my house right so you're you're a new yorker so like you know i'm sure you have more feeling about the city than i do but and i i think we both kind of feel like 
this city is like a you know really hardcore you know like you gotta really work hard to conquer it and it doesn't give you a break no no and uh, unfortunately like one thing about New York City and I experienced this when I first moved here the the first two years I lived here were like impossible for me but it is a city there's eight million people here there's probably twenty million during the course of the workday. Doesn't matter. It is still the loneliest city in the world. Definitely. But I think coming from the culture that you d- came from, I'd imagine that that was extra hard for you, right? Was it hard to kind of find a group of people to relate to? That wasn't the hardest part. Like finding friends in New York wasn't the hardest part. I think the hardest part is being a New Yorker and, you know, fixing that loneliness. I think that's the hardest part. Like yeah. as a New York, it doesn't matter where you come from. You're going to become a New Yorker. And you have to get used to the loneliness, you know, the, the harshness, you know, everything else. It's, it come with, it comes as a whole package to anybody. It doesn't matter where you're from. You're from a big town, from a small town, you're from America, you're from like Europe, you're from Asia. It doesn't matter. You know, if you if you live here, you become a New Yorker. Then that's you know that's like a I don't know. It's like an invitation to New York City. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It's because like New, in, in New York, everybody has a chance to move forward and. In what they is, it's expensive, but everybody does have that chance. It's just it doesn't matter where you come from. Before then, they don't care if you were a poor country boy growing up, or if you nobody cares, or if you were a rich kid from Miami. When you move to New York, it's like you're born. Start now. That's you're fresh out of the womb when you come to New York. Yeah, no, uh, basically everybody's pretty brutal, but it's not like they're mean. Just you know, just what it is. We just don't like to waste time. And if there's anything about New York that I take pride in, is that. My favorite thing about being in New York is reminding people that I'm from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that, that part cracked me. Yeah. Well, it's true. Every time I go to California, it's just like, hi, my name's Alex. I'm from New York. Hey, my name's Alex. I'm from New York. And you, you see people go like, oh, God, he's from New York. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is pretty different from, from Cali, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. In New York, I don't have to drive everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But... I'd imagine, because obviously I hear the Mongolian influence in your music, did moving to New York and sort of making that change influence your art at all as well? Uh, not really. I mean, I did go back to uh, Inner Mongolia and China a lot um, every year, every summer. Yeah. So I don't think, that, I don't think it's the, 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 the change of the scenario that made the music different. I think it's the, uh, the conflict of walking between so many different worlds that really kind of confused me for a while. You're in America, then you're in Mongolia, you're in Beijing, and you know, all those cultures mixed out in your brain. You kind of just like it, it confuses you sometimes. You know? Yeah, definitely. And es- especially, to- uh, especially uh, uh, when you don't see the similarities and the universal thing between all humans. That just like that confusion can become bigger, bigger. But the more you challenge yourself to see things in a more linear and more coherent way, the more the more uh, sense you will feel about the world. It doesn't matter how many worlds you're traveling between, you know. Absolutely. Kind of feels like a shaman to travel in between different worlds, like a different spirit. <laughs> well, I know people who lost their shit because they were going back and forth from the suburbs to the city every day. It's crazy going back and forth between so many worlds. It's like different language, different food, different mentality, different politics, blah blah blah. I mean like that's why like the more I go, the more like, you know what, I just wanna I just want to spend some time with horses. Just be simple. <laughs> yeah, horses are better listeners than a lot of people we've encountered, right? Uh, I mean, they are honest. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. But you know, one scenario might be a little different. But like uh, Bon Jovi mentioned in an interview one time that you know you play a stadium in front of fifty thousand people, and then you're thrown into a car and you're thrown right into a hotel room with nobody in there and nothing but. You hear nothing but your ears ringing, and that transition it really messes with your head. Mm, I, I I can get what he's saying because I never played in a stadium, but I'm sure from his you know the extent uh, level of difference he experienced definitely can explain you know how you feel about it. But I mean, when we play like big shows, um, um, well, actually the biggest show we played it was in Wacko Open Air. That was like eight eight thousand people or something. Yeah. I mean, when when you finish the show, people just came to you, you hang out, drinking beer, so you don't feel like that. And uh, mostly for our shows, uh, after the show, we'll, we'll we'll hang out with people mostly. So I don't think I kind of feel like that ever before. Well, in metal, it's kind of different. Like Gojira just did a whole tour with Metallica, and 
you see these guys on the subway and nobody even looks in their direction. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, but but definitely, you know, the the difference of you know different uh, soon, chapters in your performance and after the per- post performance, definitely, you know, it, it kind of is it's definitely a very different psychological experience for you. Yeah, that's for sure. And now from uh, talking with you in the past, I know that uh, you are also very profound in musical theory. That's what you originally came here for. So did studying music theory also help perfect your craft in a way? Or in the end, like with what you've done with Tanger Calvary, it was just solely you and from your own personal perspective? Or did maybe studying music and the theory also hone your craft at all? Um, theory definitely helps. I mean... Uh, how to construct a chord, how to you know orchestrate different instruments. That's like kind of like a, a thing for Tinker Cavalry, uh, because I, I I try to you know um, pro, you know do some progressive stuff, not just writing uh, guitar works, but also put fiddle, plug it kind of like a heavy metal symphony, uh, in a folky way, which is weird. But <laughs> yeah. so that that we in this process, the theory they definitely provide tools for you to construct this new texture of music notes so yeah absolutely and you could definitely tell like it, there's not nothing really out of place in what you've done yeah i'm trying to <laughs> now as of being a vocalist as well do you have to hear music before you write lyrics or because your music is so concept driven that you the, that in the end everything kind of works together at once they kind of work together as one you know i, I usually just jam and you know just go with it you know i don't really uh think too hard on it Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time, man. Thanks, buddy. It's so great that you guys are back and thank are ready you, to conquer the world again. Heart is officially out now. Could we be expecting any more new music? At um, we are playing a new show, which is yep. at. I was gonna save that for last. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna play a uh, uh, a traditional Mongolian concert music at um, Carnegie Hall uh in september so uh um, september 20th yeah hopefully uh, i'm gonna see you guys there yeah we'll see you there <laughs> oh of course i'll be in the front row all right i'll man. be the guy waiting in the front entrance like at nine in the morning like with a flower or something <laughs> oh flower flower and booze <laughs> and a pink shirt <laughs> all right let's not go too far it's still it's still a semi-metal show i'm wearing the black shirt <laughs> but um is Aside from heart, is that the only new music we are going to be hearing for now, or could we be expecting anything more? Um, for now, that's all we have. Okay, but but something's on the horizon. I feel it. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I'm not going to assume. <laughs> all right, then. But everybody, we are here with my good friend, Nature of Tanger Calvary. Pick up the latest single, Heart, if you haven't already. Playing at Carnegie Hall, September 20th. We'll see you next time on Heavy New York, everybody.